I'm Clara. I'm a first year student at Napier. I've been involved with computer for quite a couple of years. Um, I was a dress code mentor. Dress codes a charity that focuses on getting girls into the computer. Um, so yeah, I'm just going to talk a bit about the numbers and what we can do about it. Um, so yeah. So the field starts to lose people or not gain people's interest as early as primary, but secondary school is really where you can start to see the decline happening. So as you can see in the graph, the numbers have been de in decline from females, which is the blue, um, since 2014. And in fact, further back from this graph, it's been dropping since 2002. So th there was a slight increase in uptake in 2020, so just last year, two years ago. Um, and you can clearly see how much of a gap exists between men and women. Um, so we're never going to get the numbers in university if we can't capture the interest early on. Um, from both men and women. Um, the numbers for males have also been dropping, as you can see, since 2016. And further back, they've been on a general decline since 2008. Um, so a lot of schools, or not a lot, some schools don't even offer computing at all. Um, and some rotate with other classes. So you get like less than 20 periods a year of computing in your broad general, broad general education year. So that's like S1 to S3. Um, and then so how can we prepare kids for the necessary skills for a computing career or just life in general when they're getting about 15 hours a year of computer education. Um, and a couple classes and a couple skills in Scotland have two or three different levels of qualifications in one class. So they might have National 4, National 5 and Hires or something in the one class. So then the teachers have to balance multiple curriculums or multiple courseworks um, and just totally different classes that shouldn't be in the same. And Obviously, the kids suffer for that. And if they're not good at secondary school, they're not going to get any better at undergrad. Um, there's about 10,000 undergrad applications in Scotland every year um, within computing. So that includes like networking, cybersecurity, software engineering, creative and social informatics, anything that comes under computing. And you can see the massive gap in girls and boys. Again, this time the blue is the girls. Um, and yeah, and the, overall the number is still pretty low, 10,000 compared to what the demand could facilitate or like what we could achieve um, if we put work into it. And we're not really producing the amount of recruits that is necessary anyway. Um, there's about 13,000 digital jobs in Scotland, um, the demand for that, and we're only producing about 5,000 new recruits each year. So a massive gap in numbers, and it raises the issue that Scotland-based com companies have to go overseas to find the skills that they need and they require. Um, as well in undergrad, 18, there's about 18% women, so 82% of any given computing degree is men, and this can be more or less dependent on the university. Um, and the issue isn't solely with women and envies and non-binary people, but with everyone in general. Um, in 2016-17, the academic year, 9.8% of graduates in computer science dropped out in computer science degrees, which is 2.6% higher than the mean dropout rate of all subjects. Um, so based on other trends, there's no more new data on this, but based on other trends, it's probable that this has continued. Um, so as I said, the, the problem originates as early as primary school, but even for women who've made it to the tech industry, the struggle's not over. Um, women are at risk of quitting their job at a 45% higher rate than men in the tech sector, um, and they're habitually outnumbered by men in tech companies. Um, we know this based on the gender gap in almost every part of computing. Um, there's a general two to one ratio, and 26% of people, uh, of women in a survey, have been outnumbered five to one multiple times before. And on top of that, 30% of women over the age of 35 are still in junior positions. And on the flip side, less than 5% of men are. And, and that's even if they get the junior positions to start with. So a HESA study, and um, that's a UK wide company, um, company, research groups, something like that, um, found that 73% of male graduates from computing are in a tech role six months after graduation compared to 58% of females. And the issue isn't just around 
women, as I said before, 75% of employees are having difficulties in recruit recruiting qualified staff due to the lack of workforce. So as a whole, we can really see that computing is a struggling subject. So in 2001, we in Scotland had just over 28,000 st students studying computing at exam level. So that's now five higher and advanced higher um, in high school. With 9,825 women, so even in 2001, there's a massive gap, um, especially, and, oh, sorry. And this dropped in nine years, so in 2010, we had a little over 22,000, and 7,100 of them were women. So that's quite a substantial drop in nine years, especially considering the tech explosion that happened in that decade. And if we go to last year's figures, um, only 9,873 people study computing science. And of that, less than 2,000 women take the subject. So in the whole of Scotland, we're currently sitting at 1,895 women taking computing, not even wanting to take a career in it, just having an exam in that's computing. And the number of teachers has also dropped from 699 to 595 in 10 years. And we just can't wait and sit for this to fix itself. Um, we can see the skill and uptake decline isn't a new thing. In fact, in 2012, on the 3rd of April, so almost a decade to the day, the BBC published an article called Warning Over Skills Gap in Computing. So a literal decade, and the problem has only got worse. So we just can't afford another 10 years in this situation. We all have to act now to save the subject, and the path to doing that is definitely at high school level. Um, getting that support for teachers, as well, as well as hooking that interest before pupils even choose their subjects in third year. So yeah, there's a lot of reasons why people might leave computer science, and we need to acknowledge and act on these. Um, the reasons I give here uh, for leaving computer science at any stage, so some might be like more relevant to high school or industry. So why women and NBs might specifically leave computer science? We've got social identity threat. So women can feel their identity within computing is perceived as unusual or negative, or they're just feeling unease or on guard about who they are within computing. Um, we do have like quite strong stereotypes in computing, and that can just relate to that. Um, a lot of people, a lot of women especially, have reported feeling imposter syndrome um, and the lack of support is definitely a big issue. There's a significant gap, um, obviously within gender, as well as the curriculum and jobs typically fashioned to men, so it's necessary to have that support available um, while there's the gap. The fear of knowing less than male counterparts, stigma, lack of role models, I think that's a really important one. Um, recently as part of a um, research group called Computing Science for Young People's Advisory Group um, I was part of. We carried out a survey um, on what students thought were the barriers to computing and this came up quite a bit in responses. Some people have also reported being discouraged by, by authority such as teachers or career advisors or even parents um, and being steered away from computing um, as it just it can't be a subject for them or like multitude of reasons. Um, and similar to this is not being taken seriously. Um, people, if people around you aren't taking you seriously just for the basis of your gender, that's going to be hard to get motivation and to stay interested in it. Um, and the atmosphere in the workplace and microaggressions just a sort of all of these things combined. Um, and it can like it's, it's often a combination of all these reasons. That I'll, these reasons and the ones that I'll get to in a second, it's never just one, which is why we have to look at all of them as a whole. So the issue isn't just solely with women and enemies, as I've said. Um, anyone might leave computing science. Um, so some reasons might be lack of retention in high school teaching. Um, some schools face a high turnover um, for these teachers as they move on to different things or they drop out. Um, and this makes it hard to create that student-teacher relationship and it makes it hard to build a strong computing department. And anyone can say face some of the reasons, like lack of support and lack of guidance. Um, if students don't know what's coming next and not knowing what to expect, 
then it can make it really difficult to choose to continue down that path of uncertainty when there's other more secure or more transparent subjects to take. And sometimes people don't feel that they need it for their career, which is like totally fine, but it's such an important aspect in all of our lives and understanding a bit of that and learning some skills, which as I'm sure we all know is pretty cool and really necessary for a wide assortment of jobs, not just computing related. So there's also the issue that some people don't even get access to computing. They don't get an option to study it in high school at all. They don't get to study it in S1. And in S1, if you don't get to study it when you first come to high school, it's going to be really hard to get that interest in second year because they've had a whole year of other subjects to like learn about and hope that interest in. Some, as I said earlier, rotate with other classes. So they're getting less than one every fortnight um, of computing. So how, how are they expected to understand the subject and to want to take it further if they're hardly getting any class time? So another issue that people, it tends to be in smaller towns and villages, that people face is they don't have a computing specific teacher. Um, they're just, there's just not the, the teachers available to go to the, uh, like the urban areas. And then finally, given worksheets, some teachers and some classes are quite lacking in their curriculum and they just get worksheets. And we know how amazing computing can be, I assume, as you're all here. But if you just get worksheets, you're never going to see that. So what we can do about it. So that was a lot of like, look at how bad this is. So this is some things that we can do. So we can create support systems. Um, so that's just so important for retention. And I've lost my stuff. And so yeah, as I said earlier, almost every woman or non-binary I have met in computer has faced imposter syndrome. So having them support systems and contacts in industry, they can really just make you feel a lot better about your career and where you can go. And then, oh, no. and then also role models are great for opening that path to computing and helping people. Um, and collaborative product projects, I'm a really big fan on. Um, there's, there's hardly going to be a time in computing when you're working on your own with no help from anyone else. So why would we not encourage collaboration from the start and start working together to solve problems? So that can build connections with students and gives people the chance to learn and teach in a less formal environment. And the last one there is really important. And I know we might not be able to do loads about this other than petition and fight for it, but funding teachers are so necessary to grow the subject. There's only so much we can talk about clubs and projects if the teachers we hope to run these are pulled in so many directions. Industry as a whole can also help a lot. Um, they have such a pivotal effect on people's confidence and access to further career furthering opportunities. So we've got mentorship programs and they can give someone a contact in the industry who's likely went through similar stuff um, and they can offer support to students or new people. Um, they, don't, they can be formal or informal um, and I can't speak highly enough of having someone to just support you and push you upwards. Um, they, can, they don't even have to be industry, they can be teachers or students further up or senior years of skill. There's also competitions. Um, they're a really good way of fostering community within the attendees and they're a good way to share information, information around teams. Sponsorships are really good. They can take a financial offload, they can give someone a contact and they, yeah, they can just make it a lot easier for someone to get into a career. And then asking for minorities feedback, so women and other minorities, is really good because you're not going to know what people want if you don't ask them and it makes them feel really heard if you specifically ask them. So yeah, our own actions. So this is something that you can really work on if you choose to, and you should if you choose to. So we can, so while change can and should happen at these larger levels, there's always small things that we as individuals can do. And these are things that can have the biggest impact short term and they can gather momentum and change the atmosphere. So we can question how we view the gender gap and the workforce in general, and if it's conducive to closing that. 
and question our own biases. So we all have them, and these can translate to microaggressions and not seeing, like, for example, women only events are productive and important for us, or not believing the issue can be solved, and obviously women don't want to do computing, which just isn't true. Um, and to look at that and to question why we think that is really important. Um, being an ally is really good, and to give credit where credit is due is one of the best ways to demonstrate that and create an inclusive environment. So yeah, it's not all bad though. Um, I want to share a success story with you. So I was incredibly fortunate to attend an amazing secondary school and we had an amazing computing department. The school wasn't that good, the computing department was great. Um, we had an almost 50-50 split of girls and boys with seven S3 classes, <coughs> so that's the year before exams. Um, we, and then in exam classes, we had four S4 classes, three higher classes, one advanced higher and an MPA class. And this didn't come about by letting it be. They, my department consistently worked hard at hooking that interest early and, let, and maintaining it. So yeah, there's down to a lot of factors and a lot of trial and error. So in my opinion, one thing that worked really well was building that strong student-teacher relationship. Um, everyone who chose higher computing at my school had at least a, had a personal relationship with at least one of the teachers. And having that and someone to talk to when you pass the department was really good at cementing a people's interest. And having a laugh with people was really fun, even if like I was doing my advanced high project and I wanted to cry, I could go and have some banter with my classmates. Um, so it's just really important to have a strong student teacher, but also student student, like to do outreach within societies and to just do socials as well in like many different areas like not just always at a pub or a club, a club just like in different places so accessibility wise there's a lot of options for people. Um, competitions and coding clubs so they're a really good structure to base that encouragement on um, just getting as many people into it as possible. Um, so during my time at Dresco Club which I was talking about earlier <coughs> I noticed great things about the passion that students can have when they're given the opportunity so the difference in someone's engagement can be so noticeable depending on the environment they're in. Um, if they're in a class, if they're in a lunch kind club, if they're with their friends, if they're on their own, it just really does depend and giving them that option and having that safe space can bring out some amazing projects as well as boosting people's confidence. So creative or collaborative projects are really good. Um, having freedom and creativity in younger years and really wherever possible um, is really important, I think. Keeping that passion and that love for computing is paramount in closing that gap. Um, people will learn what they need to, and if they don't, you can offer options for learning, but people do tend to learn what they need to, just given a, just given a, a push in the right direction. So a flexible curriculum is similar to that. Um, it's a bit harder, obviously, when you're in third and fourth year of a university degree and you need to do things but having options especially in first year that people can do and having options within like society is really good at just like maintaining that and keeping that passion because people do love computing and I've met so many people in younger years like in high school that really really loved it and I know that a lot of them will lose out on that just because of the access that they have. And finally, having a supportive teaching department is really important because teachers, if they are pulling their weight and if they have people that they can support that can support them all the time, it's just really good. And it comes, it shows that in the students and it shows that they have a love for the subject. So yeah, it really is possible to turn the skills, skills decline around with some targeted work. Um, and it's really, it is happening. We can see there's so many movements that are, are making this happen, um, but we really just do have to work hard and it's gonna take a while until we see results, but we've just gotta keep working at it for women and just anyone in general in computing. So yeah, thank you for listening. Um, yeah.